when major things happen in history, it does make a difference for the future. But I also think with 9-11, you know, you got to remember to kind of know what happened in the past to kind of not make mistakes too. Here's the thing. Life is short and things rarely go according to plan. You owe it to yourself to do more than just survive. You deserve to thrive. So start now. Take the chances, be yourself, pursue happiness, and live your best life. I'm your host, Taylor Stern, and welcome to The Thriving Podcast. Okay. It is September 7th, 2021, but in a couple days, it will be September 11th, 2021, which is now 20 years since 9-11, which seems just like yesterday, but so long at the same time, so much has happened. But I still believe that 9-11 for our generation and for anybody who lived through it old enough to remember, it will be one of those experiences that you will remember every single detail that happened that day and pretty much what happened around it. And so I wanted to bring on two familiar faces this week for our podcast. And I I know it seems a little bit odd for a thriving podcast to be talking about 9-11, but as we were discussing it and figuring it out, we really realized that our family was truly impacted by 9-11 We know so many others were. It's something that we can all unite on and talk about. And I wanted to bring my dad and my mom, Johnny Boy and Les, who have been in other podcasts with us to discuss about how it impacted their lives. My dad being a pilot at the time, my, well, he's still a pilot, but definitely flying that day. My mom being a history school teacher then, my sister and I really, we had enough understanding but it was such a chaotic experience as it was for so many families. And so we wanted to talk about that, what we learned, get a really interesting viewpoint from my dad as a pilot, my mom as a history teacher, and what we you know, saw in the aftermath of 9-11 with the Afghanistan war, President Bush ha- handling of it, and then, of course, how we've grown from it, you know, our family, you know, my dad ended up being furloughed, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, how we grew from that. And then now, you know, being social media. So we'll get to it all. But welcome in Johnny Boy and Les. Hello. Hey, how's hey. it going? Good to see yes. You. Can you believe it's been 20 years since 9-11? It's been a long time. Yeah. I mean, a lot of things have happened in the past 20 years. And, you know, a lot of things have changed in the aviation industry as a result of it. But um, yeah, it's, it's been a while. To me, yeah. it's like yesterday, because I still really get upset. I really, it's, it's very, um, very upsetting to me. And it just feels like yesterday. And it, I, I, I think it's going to be hard next week for so many people. Why specifically on the 20 year mom? Well, you know, it's kind of like a milestone, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And I can just recall so much of it and it just seems like it was yesterday and you still have that icky feeling watching take place and all that. And then being that we've been to the memorial, which is beautiful. I just think we also, one of the big things we just have to remember these people that um, we lost that day and then their families who have suffered. Yeah. And, you know, obviously the end of the war in Afghanistan, I think that also kind of stirs it all up again as well. So, but before we get to all of that, dad, I want to start with you. Can you give us a minute by minute, you know, walk us through what you experienced on September 11th, 2001? Okay. Well, like I, uh, we were uh, doing a 737 trip to Calgary, Alberta, and we were finishing it up. It was supposed to be our, well, second to last leg of the trip. And we were flying from Calgary direct to Newark, New Jersey, out on the East Coast. And we were going to be leaving in the morning. Real so, quick, I'm sorry. What, yeah. How long would that flight be from Calgary to Newark? I want to say anywhere from four to five hours. Okay. 
you know, not not a really long, you know, probably like a transcontinental flight sort of time frame, but uh, not too bad. I mean, we we'd leave around nine in the morning and get there, you know, about midday or so, and um, you know, we'd lose a couple of hours going eastward, but you know, it's still, you know, get there in, in daylight and everything would be pretty good. But uh, so I was getting up in the morning, you know, getting everything put together, packing up my bag, taking the shower, getting all ready to go. And turned on the TV like I do most places, you know, just to get the morning news before I go. And it was the Today Show and, you know, they were showing this building and I was like, well, what is this? And you could see the uh, one of the uh, World Trade Center towers, you know, with the smoke coming out of it. And so I sat down, I was watching this going, what is going on? And uh, then we see the, the second tower get hit. And it was just, you know, you're, you're kind of stunned at that point. You're like, okay, so this is not normal. Because at first they were thinking, you know, somebody like a small airplane or something had hit the tower, like maybe somebody- Like a was, private plane private, type thing? Exactly. Small they, private they plane. They thought it was like a private plane or something had hit the tower. But when the second one hit, then we knew that something was going on, that there was something going on. And then when the, the Pentagon was hit, they knew that this was not, a, you know, obviously something was seriously wrong and- uh, this was not going to be like any other day. But you didn't get contacted immediately? No, because it was just, it was happening so fast. I, I don't think anybody really had time to react at that point. And um, mm -hmm. so, it, I, you know, we were sitting in our hotel rooms and we were like, so I contacted the captain and we were like, well, watching it on TV going, well, uh, what's going, you know, do we need to contact somebody? And we tried to contact scheduling and they were trying to figure out what was going on. I think they were talking to Newark and, and then I believe there was a uh, air traffic controller in either JFK or Newark who made the, uh, the call to ground all aircraft mm -hmm. and to stop all flights. And so they grounded all the aircraft. They stopped all departures out of Newark. How did they communicate that to you though? Well, they can, they, you know, we, we got, uh, I think when, we contacted scheduling, then they let us know that that was going on there and that we should just hold tight in our hotel room for the time being until they could figure out what was going on. And uh, then we, you know, obviously more things were going on. We heard about the, the crash in Pennsylvania and we were just like, okay, this is, this is crazy. And so we basically just stopped what we were doing and got, you know, everybody got around the TV and we were just watching it like everybody else in America at that time. And uh, I tried to call Leslie at the, at the time. I did have a cell phone and I was able to, you know, it wasn't one of the, you know, it was an older cell phone, I mean, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, flip phone, I think it was, but uh, I was able to get, I think it was able to get through to you or did I get through to your parents? It took, um, we kept, I kept trying to call you and you were trying to call and the lines were, yeah, the lines were saturated, saturated. Lines, saturated. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I went to school right? and, um, you finally called my parents who were able to get hold of my talk right. to my mom to say that you were still in Canada yeah, that, and you had not flown into right, New York. We had not taken off. We were on the ground. Mm -hmm. We were not going anywhere for the time being. And then when we finally, you know, we talked to scheduling and they said, Hey, everybody's grounded across the United States. Nobody's flying anywhere. Just hang loose and they'll let us know what was going on. So we figured we were going to be there for a couple of days, if not longer. And, uh, we hunkered down and, um, just kept watching the news to see what was going on and talking to scheduling to see what they were thinking. And basically at that point, it was just a day by day as to when they were going to uh, open up the airspace again and let people start flying. And so it was just a matter of, uh, you know, listening to the news and contacting the company and then trying to get a hold of everybody's family. And a lot of the flight attendants didn't have cell phones back in those days. And so I was letting my cell phone be used for the, by the flight attendants so that they could contact their families if they could get through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm curious because you said you saw the second plane hit. And I know, especially with pilots, I really think any pilot can usually name an aircraft. They'll be like, oh, this is this kind of aircraft. Oh, well, yeah, Did you yeah. know that was a commercial airline? Oh, yeah. Flight? When I saw that and they slowed down the, the video so you oh. could actually see it happen, it was, there was no doubt it was a commercial aircraft, uh, an airliner of some kind. <laughs> probably a, you know, a seven, six or a seven, five, it looked like a fairly large aircraft. Um, so you it, knew immediately that it wasn't this charter plane. No, it wasn't. Well, well, wait, the first one, but with the second one, did, 
The first one we didn't, I didn't see. You couldn't see tell because you could see the smoke on the other side right. of the building. But with this other one, the second it one you saw it fly clearly, in. Yeah. You saw it fly right into the building. And it was like, real awkward. Did they even have footage of the first one hitting because no one knew it was going to happen? You know? Think, yeah, I don't think they really did. I don't did. think they did. I don't really. think they did. They may have, somebody may have been filming something and got it, you know, but at, at at the start, I don't think they did, but they definitely have video of the second one hitting. How and quickly it, did, it, well, go ahead, mom. The really interesting thing is that um, when that guy made that call to ground all the planes in the country, you know, normally I don't think people realize how crowded our airspace oh, is. Yeah. If oh, you yeah. only knew how many planes were flying up above us, I mean, hundreds. Because it's at different levels too, right? Like yeah. altitudes and, you know, there's planes everywhere. There's probably 20 planes flying over us now. We don't know it. You know, and, yeah. and, and in addition to stopping the ones from taking off, there was all these aircraft that were on, you know, landing. And, uh, you know, there was aircraft coming in from overseas that had to land. I mean, and a lot of them ended up going into Nova Scotia and Canada from, you know, the ones that were coming mm -hmm. in from the, uh, from Europe and things like that. But there's a, there's a really awesome picture of the fact that you see all the planes in the air. Right. And then when that guy makes that call, because all, it shows all the planes are like orange right. spots. Like little yellow planes flying And around. then after they made the call, nothing. the airspace, nothing. Yeah, just everything. Mm -hmm. It just it kind was of weird to think hundreds of flights in the air and then boom, nothing. Yeah. Now, my godfather was flying for American at the time. I don't, but that was the big thing. And that was something that I remember distinctly from that day. They didn't release the airline right away. You didn't know what airline was being impacted until probably about noon, I would say, you know. And right. so then finally, once we heard, you know, because I think there was a lot of panic coming from our side. And I'll let mom tell that after, but we didn't know the airline. After that, did you reach out to Jack pretty quickly or how did you get in contact with him or any of your other friends that fly for those airlines? Well, after, you know, after we contacted family members and we made sure everybody was in the know of what, where, where I was and what was going on and that everybody was safe at the time, then I started trying to call my friends who were in the airlines to see if they were involved in anything. And that's, I think that's when I was able to talk to Jack and, and see what he was doing and you know, find out that he was safe and he wasn't involved in anything. But yeah. uh, I did, uh, you know, it was later in the news that they had pulled some people off of aircraft that were still on the ground that hadn't taken off yet. And they were, they had pulled some additional people off there that they were, that were uh, sus suspects. <laughs> and I think one of those aircraft, you know, might've been a, a continental aircraft out of New York that they had pulled somebody off of. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. So then the flip side, we're at home. Right. And mom, I'll let you tell it from your vantage point of how the day started. You got up ready to go teach. It was a Tuesday and our great grandmother, my, your grandmother, Nana was visiting at the time. So she's sitting there watching the TV and then I hear, you know, the today show. And they said that there's a plane that hit one of the towers in the world trade center. And again, they thought they were saying it was probably a, a private aircraft. So they were saying that on the news. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. With the oh I don't remember that. And yeah. they showed the smoke coming up, bill, you know, billowing out of the building. And then I'm watching the news about this thing because I'm going back and forth getting you and your sister ready for school. And Nana's watching TV. And I witnessed live the, the second large aircraft. second aircraft hitting it. And we were like, oh, my God. I mean, it was like, whoa. And of course, yeah, that's what we're thinking. Well, I knew he was flying into New York that day. Yeah. I didn't know what, because again, we didn't really, back then, you know, we instantaneously, because of social media and all that, you know, we can talk right away and it's pretty easy to talk to each other. But you right. got to remember when you first started flying, we were using a pager to talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now you can even do Wi-Fi and, and phone calls from the aircraft right. directly. And it's, it's quite easy. Mm-hmm. Back, but back then, you know, once you're in the air, it was very difficult to get in touch with people. So, um, you know, I was nervous. I was scared. I know you guys were scared and I kept telling you, oh, no big deal. Cause you watch, you guys happen to see it too. And you were probably, I want to say, uh, 2001. I would have been nine. You were in the fourth, third or fourth grade. Fourth grade. Yeah. Okay. So your sister would have been in first grader third grade and or no second grader i decided that the best thing to do is um to go 
take it like a normal day and not panic. That was the worst thing. Cause if I panicked or acted weird, I thought you guys would. So I decided just to go to work and send you guys to school like normal. And that's exactly what I did in the back of my mind wondering, well, okay, what's trying, what's going on with John? But again, I couldn't get hold of him. And uh, what happened was, which was very interesting is that the principal of my school, when I went to school, um, well, we were all in the classrooms watching it, which was really weird. All the teachers mm-hmm. and um, the principal of the school, my mom called the school and the principal came personally to the classroom to tell me that John was not on one of those planes, that he was still in Canada, mm-hmm. that my mother had talked to him. So that kind of, but then you're spilling this, this sorrow and this you know, confusion about what's going on in my students. You know, I've had students that I've run into since that, that are like somewhere and they'll say, I was with you that day. Do you remember us being together that day? And the students were really respectful and very sweet and very kind, but it was, it was really strange. And then the school counselor, um, I think was worried about you guys. Um, mm-hmm. happened to be a personal family friend of ours and she- Oh, Susie. Susie Cheney, yeah, mm-hmm. and called her, and uh, I think she might have even called me. I'm not quite sure, but you, you guys were doing good, but she did call you guys in, didn't she, to talk to you guys to see how you were doing? Well, I'll tell my perspective of it, yes, but she did. She did, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, we got a lot of support and everything else like that, but we, it was just, you know, I was relieved it wasn't John, but then when it all these things started- But then you know how it is for other families. Build, yeah, and I mean- you know, some of these that Beamer, I think that was his last Todd, name. Todd Beamer. I still remember so much about him and his beautiful, cute little wife. And he was a pilot for which airline? No, he no, was no, the he, guy that he was on the flight that uh, crashed in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. And, and he, was, he was, the was the one who said, "Let's roll." Right. Let's roll. And he mm-hmm. actually graduated from my high school. Mm-hmm. He graduated from Los Gatos High School. Um, you know, he, in I believe '86. I was '81, so he was about five years behind me. Yeah. Uh, they yeah, it's a connection. Them. I think everybody feels deeply connected in some facet, even if you weren't. I mean, we were in New Mexico. We were probably, you know, the furthest away from New York compared to California. And I think everybody felt the impact. And that's why it was such a unifying day um, in a negative, obviously somber way. But I remember, mom, I don't think I was up yet when that first plane hit. I remember waking up when you saw the second plane hit. And I think you were like, oh, girls, girls, get in here. You know, like you were pretty quick. I definitely remember you called us in there and then you're watching it and you don't really, I didn't know what was going on. I remember you said like, get ready, get ready. And then, you know, we got ready. And I remember driving to school with Nana and I can't, I think I just kind of thought like, oh, okay, like this could be something. And you don't know, I think when you're that young, you think your dad's like the only pilot out there. Like he's the only one doing the job, even though you know how many pilots are there in the world, like so many. And so I remember talking to Alex and I, you know, Alex was obviously upset. And then we didn't know what the trade center towers were. We had just gone to Newark and Washington, D.C. for spring break the year before. And dad, you pointed them out to us. So we'd seen them standing in March of 2001. And then, but I didn't really know why. And I think I asked Nana, like, why would they do that? And she said that that was a central spot of America and that it was to like shake our core. And I think at that point, we knew it was a terrorist attack once we had seen the larger plane. Right. And then I remember I went to school and I was, you know, obviously visibly upset, you know, didn't know anything. And I had PE early on in that day. And I'll never forget. I I could say the name and I won't say the name because it's damaging. And I think this PE coach like almost laughed about it. And I think there was a lot of confused emotions for a lot of people that day because there was just so much unknown And he's like, you don't know, we don't know what's happened yet. And kind of like almost was very like, yeah, just dismissive. But like, I just remember him saying something like that I was so offended by. And I think it was like something political too. And it didn't even feel political at that point. 
and not political then. Yeah. you don't know anything about politics. I didn't know Republican, Democrat, whatever. And then at around two-ish, I think, is when Susie called us in. It was a long day. We didn't know. And Susie called us in. And I, you called us, though, Dad. We had talked to you at the school. And Alex and I were both in there. And then I think we like sat in there for the rest of the day. I want to say, mom, you picked us up though from school. Mm -hmm. I, I think you came to pick us up. Well, what I did is after I found out that your dad had called the States, then I called Susie right away and said, go tell the girls everything. Daddy's fine. Because I knew that that would be the first thing that you would, that was very important to get that information to you. And then we watched the news for like how many days, like the rest of the world. Right. But it and was it, yeah. so bizarre. Yeah. And it just got really weird, you know? And so we just kept checking in every day with the company and they kept, they kept putting us off and putting us off as far as, you know, okay, we're not going, nobody's flying yet. Right. And it wasn't until Saturday that we could actually plan on getting airborne again. And, the, you know, they told us, okay, you can fly, but you're not going to go to Newark at this time. You're just going to fly directly back to Houston and uh, bring the plane back home. And so we uh, loaded up, we did have uh, some passengers on board, but um, it was uh, actually, no, I take that back. We didn't have any passengers on board. So where, what happened to those passengers? How'd they get displaced? They just stayed where they were and had to figure out their own on how to get back to where they wanted to go. Um, Cause the airspace was messed up. Yeah, the airspace was still yeah. pretty, you know, it was closed, but they allowed flights to uh, take off without passengers just to get you know to put the air, get the aircraft back to their uh, you know reposition the aircraft and so we had the flight attendants on board but uh, it was just it was just an empty airplane but uh, you know we were talking about how we would you know brace the door in the future flights to keep people from getting into the cockpit and what we would you do. were already talking about that then oh yeah absolutely and okay what we would you know what what things we would do and how we would do it. And so we were already talking about uh, procedures that we would do. Now, granted, in the coming weeks, and, and I think within the next year, they developed the, uh, the new doors to the cockpit and the new procedures on getting in and out of the cockpit. Whereas before that, it was, you know, you just kind of come and go. But I remember when he was flying over Denver and we were living in Texas and the captain called me up and I was able to go in the cockpit and sit on the jump seat to look at the beautiful lights of Denver from the cockpit. You'd never many be years to... before 9-11, many, oh, many years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're talking like the year 2000, maybe. Well, no, before that, it was before probably that, like the 90s. Yeah, yeah. 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 When, he first when he first started with Continental Airlines. Yeah. And uh, that was- And that was, an, that was, of course, that stopped immediately. Oh, yeah. you know, nobody was ever allowed in the cockpit after that, after takeoff or, you know, until after landing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and they developed new procedures. You started getting more air marshals on aircraft. But it was uh, interesting because once we got back to Houston, we go into the crew room where all the crew are gathering because this is the first day they've allowed aircraft to fly back. So we're all kind of, you know, gathered there around the TV watching the news. And um, our CEO of the entire company basically comes in and just says, okay, we're going to be furloughing some pilots pretty quick. Right well, away? Oh yeah, no, actually it wasn't, it, he wasn't there in the crew. I mean, he was talking on TV mm -hmm. and he said- This that, is like less than a week after 9-11. I remember being on the phone with you. Right. And you were in Houston and you said, I'm going to get furloughed on Saturday. So like, was there any emotional support? Did they offer you any guidance? <sighs> Not really. I mean, it was, I don't know, you know, nothing like this had ever happened. And, you know, they, you know, with pilots were very stoic and very, you know. Yeah, it's not really a thing. Yeah, military so, backgrounds too. A lot of people have military yeah, backgrounds. Absolutely. So they, you know, they, they were talking about furloughing and uh, I wasn't in that first group that was going to be furloughed, but uh, I was, you know, in the last group that got furloughed. And so, you know, it was kind of hanging over our head for about a year before we got, fur before I got furloughed. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was not a, not a good time. And we yeah. were trying to figure out, okay, if I get, you know, if I lose my job, what's going to happen? Are we going to be able to make it? And, um, but weren't you emotional with what had happened anyway? Like, how were you processing that as a person? Yeah, you've already got the emotions of losing, you know, people in the industry and, you know, all those people who were you know, killed in, in New York. Mm -hmm. And then you've also, then you add on to that, you know, what's going to happen with your livelihood? Are you going to be able to support your families after that? And, 
because everything, you know, the whole economy just came to a crashing halt all of a sudden, especially the, the aviation, you know, the travel industry. Because people mm -hmm. didn't want to fly after that. They well, nobody wanted to travel, period. You know, there was, you know, and they were, and so they basically, that's when the TSA was developed and uh, they were trying to figure out how they could uh, develop a, a way to, you know, to strengthen our security going in and out of the airports. The TSA wasn't developed before that? That's when it became. That's when it started. Right after uh, What? Well, they would they would check you before you got on right, there was security. for weapons. Yeah, there was But security. they didn't have this liquid thing and patting and, you and down. And the shoes and these were all things that kept coming every year there was something new. There was a shoe bomber who and so then everybody had to take their shoes, shoes off, off going through security. Yeah. And then there was somebody, you know, they found people carrying liquids. Mm -hmm. And and trying to make a bomb out of these liquids. And so suddenly you couldn't carry any liquids on board. Okay, so it was then the shoe bombs and it was one thing after another. Right, and so, but there was more and more security that they would develop and more procedures that they would develop to strengthen our security and, uh, you know, make us a safer flying, but, you know, restricting our ability to just walk onto an airplane, mm -hmm. you know. They stopped allowing people to come through the terminal if you didn't to have a greet ticket. People. Yeah, you couldn't greet people coming off the airplane anymore. You know, to they wait stopped outside that. the area. Yeah, yeah like in all those old movies now where you right. see people run through. It was exactly. exciting. Yeah, exactly. yeah, back then. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you could just walk right up to the planes almost. Mm -hmm. It was crazy. So coming coming back to the aftermath. You know, obviously, I think America unified like never before. We were one of those families that made the American flag pins. You know, everybody was closer than ever. I think, I think you finally felt like I'm an American and we've been attacked and we will come together. There was, I don't remember this and I would need your explanation. There was, everyone supported President Bush. There was no going, I think there was some suspect of how he handled it at, at first, but I really think that he was now a figure for our country. Right, everybody kind of rallied around him. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't really have an opinion about him, good or bad, He's, you know. But after that, I thought, he's our president. No. And I think that way, you know, you just do that being I, that I was a government and a history teacher. And I just said, you know, we stand, you know, because the old thing to me, and I really believe this, is united we stand, divided we fall. And yeah. so I, I really felt that, you know, not to say negative things about the government or anything, because we all are Americans. We really are. Mm -hmm. well, that's, what they, that's what they were trying to accomplish by the 9-11 attacks is to try to divide us and and so discord and chaos so that you know people wouldn't know what's going on right. and our economy would collapse and you know but i think we everybody showed them that you know we can have we ever been attacked, attacked like that before no i know 93 well wait a second there were shortages on flags first of all you couldn't even hardly get an american flag they ran out of well them you have to everybody wanted them. you have to understand there had never been that large a loss of life on american soil by a foreign by a foreign government i guess or a foreign entity since world war ii in pearl, pearl harbor, harbor. Mm -hmm. and so that's it had been that long since you know something of that magnitude had happened especially on u.s soil how do you feel dad i'm curious just before we move forward to of interesting things how do you feel when people say that 9-11 was a conspiracy theory well, that's, it's just, it's crazy. It's, you know, it's yeah. people looking for conspiracy theories where there are none. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's just, you know, people are always going to try to see different venues and different angles. And, you know, they're always going to think that there's some nefarious plot in the background that, you know, there, something's going on. And it's just, you know, the facts spoke, spoke for themselves that it wasn't anybody, but with the people that they caught, and, you know, and, yeah, conspiracy. I, I I have something to share. You know, unfortunately, they um, people of Muslim descent, whatever, got picked on. You know, there was violence toward them. A lot of discrimination stemmed from 9/11. Sure, yes, absolutely. it was very absolutely. sad. And I remember one time um, I would we you know we'd get on planes, Alex and you and I, and a lot of times you guys couldn't sit next to each other because we just got on because we were you know standby. We're yeah. flying standby. Right. You get the seat. You don't, you don't complain. You don't complain. You just take what you get. And I were walking on the plane and Alex was in front of me and there was a seat there. And I said, you sit in that seat. Cause then the, when you're last one to get on the plane, they don't assign you a seat. They just say, take the first a lot sit. Of yeah, just sit. sit, get sit. on quick. Cause we're going. 
and I put Alex in the seat and there, she was next to a man that had like a, was it a turban, turban? on was his it, head? Was it a seat or something like? I can't, I can't remember. But anyway, you should have seen your sister's eyeballs. They about popped out of her head. Now this, is, this is a second grader. Yeah. Second grader, or a third grader. It was the year after or so. And she looked so scared. Well, Why? Because, because the fear of yeah that had been and that's a child's innocence yes right sure. and 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 by that time we had gone into afghanistan and things like that i remember so it might even been a couple of years after i don't remember but i'll never forget it was the most beautiful thing the man was so wonderful to her and she well you know she can talk to anybody yeah she, they talked the entire she probably time. said my dad is a pilot and yeah yeah and they talked the entire time and when i got because I would tell you guys to stay in your seat as I would get off the plane if I was behind you as I'm getting off um Alex you know is just loving this you know saying you know it's nice to meet you and all that she's a little girl and he said oh I really enjoyed your daughter and and all that and I I thought that was a really beautiful lesson because you kids had kind of been traumatized by that but um and they were afraid and that taught you know Alex, and I think I even mentioned it to you too, that you can't judge people by the way they look because it can be really nice. Well, and I think that we've seen that many, many times. Dad, we've talked about that before on the podcast about, you know, different discrimination, especially being Jewish and different things that you faced in your life. But yeah, there was a lot of fear and there was a lot of probably propaganda that we didn't even realize at the time, especially when we were entering a war you know, and just different media that we were consuming. Now it's so much different. And I did want to talk about that. I mean, I'm really grateful that 9-11 didn't happen when social media was around. It would have been insufferable and it would have been so unfair to those families. I think that people post things so instantly, they don't think about it. I mean, you would have had text message. I mean, look what happened. And I think a perfect example of what happened with Kobe Bryant's death and what happened with the helicopter crash and the misinformation that was spread via social media and just the horrible ugliness that came out in some people of spreading videos that weren't true. And, you know, at first it was 14 different people that were on this plane or this helicopter and for 9-11 to have happened pre-internet, you know, obviously the internet was around, but not to that magnitude, I think is such a blessing. Well, we would have seen too much. The only way you found information was radio, TV, or paper. And mm -hmm. even when Princess Diana died, I remember that distinctly in the fact that the news didn't have it quite straight because, of course, it's in Europe and all that. But can you imagine social media with that whole thing? No. So, yeah, social media really has made a great impact and I think the thing of it is is that for us as a family there was a plane crash that happened in a New York neighborhood like a couple of weeks after 9-11 right I don't remember it was an American Airlines plane I don't remember okay. what I don't remember this I don't remember if there were fatalities or anything there were. yeah there were and um I remember that was what really shook me to the core because you know, 9-11, I was experiencing with everybody else and everybody was feeling bummed and, you know, trying to unite and all that. But that kind of hit home a little close. And then I, I remember then not long after that, he was flying out of England. Right. Remember that? Well, that was when they had the, uh, I guess, the liquids. The liquid thing. Right. And he was flying out of England that morning and they got it off, of, you know, a plane going to America. And then I was thinking, well, are they on the other planes leaving England? And I tried to call him. I did not get to talk to him to find out really where he was. Even when I called the airlines, because they didn't, have, they said I couldn't identify myself. Um, I didn't talk to him till seven o'clock that night. Wow. I've been to you know Cleveland. Yeah. So, you know, it was all unraveling. What would you say is the biggest lesson that we learned as a country from 9/11, or just as individual people? Just to you know uh, pull together and uh, you know pool our resources and uh, act as one towards a common goal i think that that made a big difference mom i think that i don't know if we learned some lessons you know 
it bothers me, you know, that the way our country is today. And I was so proud back then. And I think that people forget that we all sleep under the same stars and walk around under the same sun every day. Humans even, not even Americans, you know. And um, I think those people, what breaks my heart is those people that lost people that day. And then let's remember the people that were working at the site to clear all the stuff and they have come down with cancer. So it was much more than the people that were killed that day. If we could really look at the numbers of those you know, precious lives, I'm sure it would be much greater. Well, yeah. And then you look at the war in Afghanistan and how that was started and, you know, just very sad, very but, sad. You know, people want to find something to blame, mm-hmm. you know, to take it out on because it feels better. Right. Yeah. And so um, that's unfortunate because that sometimes catches innocent people in that with, especially with racism and such like that. But that, you know, you want to find something to take it out on or to blame or whatever. And the thing of it is, is that like, even today, you just, we just got to stick together and, and be good to one another. And, you know, it doesn't hurt to give a smile, do whatever it is. And I think 9-11 taught some people not to take every day for granted. I mean, because I heard it often said that when those some of those passengers left their homes that morning to board their flights or whatever, you know, they said goodbye nonchalantly. And so it wasn't, you know, the people said that they wish they would have said more to that person before they walked out that door, not knowing that they'd never see him again. Yeah, I do. That's a great point to bring up. I do think that 9-11 took our country in a, well, not even our country, just individual people took notice of the fact that it was a regular Tuesday. No, never before was September 11th a point of interest. It was never thought of. They said it was a beautiful, I mean, the most perfect weather, beautiful day in New York City that day. Yeah. I mean, crisp fall day. Now, Dad, do you still have those images? You did go to New York. How how much longer after that was? Uh, About two weeks after. You went to New York. And what did you see? Um, Well, we went to the, we tried to walk over to the site and <clears throat> of course everything was cordoned off and you couldn't get very you know super close but we were able to get a little bit you know you know as close as we could get but you could see all the workmen you know clearing the the debris and trying to get things cleaned up mm-hmm. but uh new york was you know coming back and it was starting to open back up again and you know and you could do see you still it. have those images uh yeah i think i do and in fact i think i still have those pictures i took some pictures from the you know we do i just don't know where they are yeah probably in your desk yeah they were filmed they were you know we didn't have the digital pictures back then but you could see the the uh smoke yeah still 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 rising off the site so mom how do you think that we could come together nowadays because now we live in a very divided nation there's a lot of frustration there's a lot of misinformation spread through media there's a lot of distrust. No one knows what to trust. And after 9-11, there wasn't that situation. I think there were, I'm sure, I'm not going to act like it was like this romanticized time. It, there was probably still a lot of different sides that maybe the we didn't cynicism, see as much. There wasn't the cynicism that there is today. Uh, you know, it was, you did not hear it on TV or, you know, with people criticizing your government or the president of the United States. Um, I remember at that time, you know, I, I can't even imagine if somebody would have said something negative about Bush because I would have been like, that's our president. Yeah, I'm cause- pretty patriotic anyway, kind of a little bit overboard as we know for 4th of July and whatnot. But, you know, I just, I think that we, we if we criticize things over and over and over again, it only weakens us. Mm-hmm. Instead of finding and looking for the strengths. I think that goes with anything, right? Mm -hmm. That could be with anything. Why do you feel so patriotic? Because I love my, I love this country. I think it's beautiful. I, the favorite song that I like is America the Beautiful. For spacious skies and, you know, amber ways. And yeah. Do you feel the same? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this, this country is, you know, given us so much Mm and, um, it's not perfect. There are things to fix, but 
we could make it more perfect. We could. And that's what the founders tried to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, but like, you know, I'll be honest. I think that we need to think about each other. Um, and I, I may get controversial here, but I believe that um, when I do something, I need to think how it's going to affect somebody else. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that um, common for the general welfare, that's one of the things in our documents, the general welfare. I think that we really need to look out for one another because in essence, it affects you too. Mm -hmm. And you got to think of others. Dad, how did you see that, you know, especially coming from a military background and then obviously, you know, being a pilot, how have you seen people rally before? Uh, like, what do you mean? Like, like, how can people come together where you don't have to have a 9-11 instance happen? Or even I think we felt like we came together a little bit with, you know, COVID, well, especially I, when COVID, it... Right. You've seen a lot of things, you know, people coming together to help others during the COVID crisis. Um, pretty much, you know, like any kind of natural disaster, uh, the fires in California or in the West. Uh, Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Katrina. Um, Hurricane Ida, the one that just happened. Um, you, it always brings out the best in people, you know, even in the worst of times. And so, you know, you can see, you know, how people do their, you know, do what they have to do to make things happen and to, you know, get things back to normal or as much a normal as they can. Mm hmm uh, mm -hmm. yeah yeah is it a weird day to fly on 9 11 it used to be uh i think it's it's mellowed a little bit you know with the passage of time people have started to it started to fade into the the collective memory a little bit more um the first five years definitely it was you know a day that people you know didn't want to fly and avoided it but now it's uh, you know, a lot of people have grown up since then, you know, like you yourself. I mean, but, you know, people who were born on that day are, you know, 20, 21 now, or, you know, so they don't, they don't really remember any lifestyles, you know, that was, that didn't have that in the background. Mm -hmm. I think more people don't know the date of September 11th and what happened, then people know what actual date Pearl Harbor happened, which is right. December 7th, 1941. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. And, but September 11th, every time I hear it, every time I hear it, I just get it. Ugh, feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, obviously five years ago was September 11th, uh, 2016. You guys were at AT&T stadium with me, which ended up 2016 ended up being the best year for the Dallas Cowboys while I was working there. But there was this, you know, incredible display. They brought out the field flag. I think there were over a hundred first responders, different people like that. And I still think it has this feeling that you just feel like, whoa. And, and Kent Garrison made that incredible video. We had gone the year before to visit the memorial right. and to talk about that because, you know, I think it was important to rebuild and to have something standing there to not have this empty space. But you go there, and if you haven't been to the memorial, I highly recommend it. But seeing the names, I think, is hard, you know, for anybody. And then, you know, some of them was unborn babies because these women were pregnant in the towers or on the planes. It's just very upsetting. Well, but I remember there was a girl I went to high school with, and um, her, no, there was a guy I went to high school with, his sister. Um, she was married to one of the guys in the tower and she was pregnant. And I remember there was a Time Magazine cover that had the mothers of people that perished with their babies. So they mm -hmm. never meet the parent. Mm -hmm. father, they never got to see their fathers. That's yeah. great. It is. I mean, I think a lot of people are feeling that way right now with the Marines that passed recently as well. That's really hard and kind of almost triggering to a lot of families. And, you know, I just... I, I don't know how we can get there. Again, you hope it doesn't have to be a tragedy incident, but uh, it was a it was a good time after the fact in the sense that we were all united. You know, there was that patriotic feeling of like, don't mess with us. Right. Yeah. And I just don't know where we can get to that again. I think social media is really a root of evil in that spot. 
I, I, it's my job. I mean, I say that every time, but I don't think that social media allows for unification. Well, people are always going to have differing opinions. It's like, how far do you go with it? Yeah. How much do you put it in somebody else's face that maybe may not agree with you? I mean, I've got friends that I know that we don't agree politically or whatever, but we just never talk about it. Mm -hmm. Make it a focal, you know, point of our friendship. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how you have to be. Because again, when it's all said and done, we're still from the same country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we will remember 9-11 and dad, the procedures are set. I don't think this could ever happen on a plane again. It'd be very difficult. I, I think that, uh, you know, not only the fact that uh, the procedures we've put in place, but the passengers themselves, I don't think they would allow it. That's true. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yes. Yeah. Because before everybody was always taught to, you know, capitulate and to kind of go along with the hijackers and just kind of be calm. And now it's like, no, no, we're not going to do that. It's, it's going to be a mob scene and, you know, they're going to be in worse shape than right everybody else because nobody's going to sit by they're going to go to the last man to try to just you know take get rid of these people before they can do damage to the aircraft I you're right willing to be stressful I more do. so now than before yeah because of the security thing and the long lines and it does add a you know more levels of stress to the oh, i didn't even realize that tsa wasn't a thing before 9-11 no. Well, I remember when I was a cheerleader in college and we had won a spirit stick and the spirit stick was probably, gosh, what would that be? 12 or 13, 14 inches. And it was a wooden stick and it was just, it had spirit, you know, red, white, and blue and all that. We had won it at a competition and the man wouldn't let us get it on the plane. When we put it out for the thing, he said, you can't take that on board. Well, we weren't going to lose that spirit stick, do you think? Yeah. Well, I went in the bathroom and I stuck the spirit stick in my leg and got on that plane with that spirit stick i have Dad. no idea what's happened I, but there was no x-rays back then or anything I, I do you know see what, what i'm saying about. you would just I, I put your know. stuff through and you you know they're looking for guns or whatever but you know it's just changed so much i mean we're gonna yeah. change because of covid procedures i mean we're gonna have salad bars again i mean things are changing when when major things happen in history, it does make a difference for the future. But I also think with 9-11, you know, you got to remember to kind of know what happened in the past to kind of not make mistakes too. Mm -hmm. To not be disrespectful or irreverent here, the true definition of thriving is to grow and to flourish. How do you think that we, in each of your own answers, how did we thrive after 9-11 to grow and to flourish after 9-11? Well, like we said, you know, in the beginning, everybody came together. And so we grew as a country in the sense that it, it brought us together towards a common goal, uh, you know, getting rid of the terrorists and rebuilding the country and getting our economy back on track. I think that um, it was a shared experience. I mean, everybody experienced that day, every American experienced, you know, that this fear of that day, the scariness, the whole thing. We've, we all experienced it. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you that if you ask any person that was alive then, you know, beyond the age of five or even maybe 10, but they can tell you exactly where they were. They yeah, I know exactly what shirt I was wearing. Shot, you know, when people land on the moon, um, you know, they can tell you. Mm -hmm. It's that dramatic. Mm hmm yeah. Well, thank you guys for joining. We will, you know, remember everyone who lost their life that day and we'll take our own time and different moments, but I appreciate you sharing your stories and yeah, we'll be back next week. All right. Sounds good. Thank you for having me. Thank Hope you're enjoying this show and if you are make sure you go find that little subscribe button on your podcast app this will ensure you won't miss a single episode thanks for listening